Welcome to Building Accessible Design Systems, Try, Try, Try Again. We've illustrated that by a wide array of button designs that we've explored throughout CVS Health. Today, Daniel and I would love to share with you the progress we've been making on our design system. It's taken us several iterations to get it right. So we'd love to share the mistakes we've made along the way toward making accessible products and services for our users. We work within the CVS Health design community. So yes, we are accessibility designers. Um, a quick introduction, um, I'm Megan, my pronouns are she, her. I'm a white woman with short brown hair, dark, wim dark rimmed glasses, and I'm wearing a green sweater for St. Patrick's Day today. Uh, Daniel, I'll turn it over to you. I am Daniel, pronouns he, him. I'm a white male in my 20s. I have dark ginger hair with some fairly bushy eyebrows that match in color. That's not a usual descriptive feature, I know, but you should see why that's, you should see why that's relevant later in the presentation. And of course, I'm wearing my cool purple Astron shirt. So thank you, Astron, for having us and to all of you for joining us today. Before we jump in, I want to give you a little background information of how we, accessibility designers, work to improve CVS's services. Medin and I aren't unicorns. We couldn't possibly be everywhere at once, with more than 100 design teams within the organization. That's why there are more than 40 design accessibility practitioners within CVS Digital, and that number is continuing to grow. Our, our design accessibility team is embedded into the greater organization. There, we work with UX, UI, content strategy, and UX research teams. We also collaborate closely with our partner program, Accessibility Engineering. They are embedded within the development teams across CPS Health, responsible for handling the technical reviews and conformance. Therefore, accessibility is built in at both sides of the house. We may be a large team and a huge organization. However, everything we say today is still relevant to a team of one. Our lessons learned and apply to anyone, even a single accessibility contributor working within the design system space. So we really hope you find today's topic useful and we would love to talk to you more based on your questions at the end of the presentation. There are four main topics we would love to discuss today. First, why defining component scope before moving forward is important and problems it can have on accessibility if we don't. Second, we'll show you how platform parity does not exist and creating consistency across Android, iOS and web it's not as easy as it may seem. In the topic after that, we will talk how we've integrated clear processes for accessibility in the design system, including in how we've baked in accessibility recommendations into components and the effects of not sharing that proudly across the organization. And then in our final topic, we'll show you our accessibility one pages, which is how we define requirements to design for real people. These are our way of communicating with the rest of the design system team. And so we will share what we've included in them. And of course, we should wrap, wrap up by sharing some takeaways and a few recommendations, recommended resources that we've helped us along the way. Let me hand it over to Megan to answer our first question today. So today, our first question that we'd like to answer is what's in a component name? What's in a name? How can we define things like cards, boxes, tiles, panels, containers, groups, or can we even do that? Each name comes with its own assumptions and each are different across the team. So if you asked six different people to design a card or a box, you would get a huge array of results, even though the components intent may be the same. As a design system team, we know we need to create a solution for designers and developers, but how can we do that when naming use cases and visual experiences aren't clear to begin with? Even more challenging, how do we write accessibility guidance for something that's so undefined? We'll end up with a long list of WCAG criteria that only increases the challenge for our design system team to define. So you'll see how quickly scope creep begins. As illustrated by my fuzzy gray feline friend in a box, or is it a container? Um, we know that we need to have an element for designers to hold grouped content, actions, and related images. But when we have something so unwieldy and not clearly defined, how do we write accessibility guidance? And where do we draw the boundaries for scope when all the components could be something so similar? Whew, okay, well, we can start by asking a few questions. First, should this solution encompass all three platforms? 
as we'll talk more about later, we can't create guidelines for something like a box or a, or a container or a card for all three platforms. So for this exercise, let's just focus on the web. Next, we'll wanna ask, what is the user experience that we're trying to create? And what does the design need? Is there a common structure within the organization already that we can pull from? Also, what, is, uh, what can we find through competitive analysis? What are other companies, design systems, thought leaders in the field, what are they doing to solve for this element? And do, does this element ever need to carry semantic meaning? Knowing this will change the way that we write accessibility guidance later on and describe the user experience. So let's hold on a minute. When we take a closer look at the elements displayed on the slide, we can start to see the pattern. These cards have, or containers have images or icons, they have a heading, they have some optional additional content. And in here we see that they actually only have link actions. So this helped us realize that many of the common patterns within CVS Health don't actually necessitate the need for a fully clickable element at all. This is great news, hooray. So now we can tell that, that while there's been requests for different components like cards or tiles or containers, these aren't actually in use right now. And it allowed us to hone in more specifically on the content and the structure. We could focus on what the groupings of these items needed to be. What are the semantics? How should images be handled? Are they decorative? Are they informative? We could also start to define what this element isn't right now. It's not fully clickable. It's not holding multimedia content. And it's commonly only using a single action. So with this pattern in play, we can start to build our accessibility guidance. This includes human impact statement, recommended experiences, WCAG criteria, and other considerations as needed. This is what we call our one pager, and we'll go over this in more detail later in the presentation. As illustrated by another gray kitty, this time, is it in a yellow container or a box? We can agree that all cats can appreciate common patterns. So by not creating something net new without collaborating within the design organization, it's best to deliver guardrails. We define that this component isn't is what it isn't and helped us narrow scope and build a good experience for our users. We can always build on this component later if the need arises. So not creating something net new will help us keep consistency for our designs and reduce accessibility issues across the organization. An accessible iteration only helps to build stronger components both now and in the future. So no matter which direction we land on, we need to consider how the name of a component can be interpreted by all of our stakeholders. So what means something to a designer could mean something totally different to a developer. For example, a banner is a region that contains mostly site-oriented content rather than page-specific content. So how can we consider, uh, are we conflating naming? Does the name still get misunderstood? We need to consider what this means for both developers and designers. So in response to these questions, we created a restricted names list. This name list doesn't mean that you can't use these names for components. It just means that it's based on ARIA roles and HTML elements on the web. So it means if you're going to use the name from a platform spec, you need to make sure that the use case meets the definition. So a couple additional examples in addition to a banner are an alert and status. These are often used in different ways within the design community, but not always in a way that reflects their proper meaning for ARIA roles and HTML elements that they represent. So with that, I will start to wrap up our component naming conversation and, keep, and ways to keep things from getting too spooky. We must remember that coming back to the intent to evolve and iterate, and not, but not cut corners for accessibility are important considerations to make. An accessible first iteration will always make building on it much easier. And it also helps to keep focus on the standards and expected components for each platform. The five topics we've learned to consider are to categorize components into logical groups, such as forms, navigation, or alert, and, can, and identify the problem and the design need to be solved. We can also set parameters around the things that we already know and backlog anything new that comes up during discovery. And then once we've defined the element, we can determine if anything that was backlogged fits into the definition. But if it doesn't, we can always come back to it later and figure out if we need to iterate. 
this leads to a deeper discussion of why we need to think about each platform when we're working on components. So with that, I'll hand it over to Daniel. Thanks, Megan. One of the many advantages to adopting a design system is creating consistency. And from my experience, aiming for consistency is something that all stakeholders can agree on reasonably easily. However, just using the phrase consistency without context or definition can end up meaning several things. When that happens, the goals we have as team members end up being inconsistent. Slightly ironic, huh? We learned that quite quickly when some stakeholders expected Android, iOS and web, the three platforms that we support, to be consistent um, and have parity with each other. But what are the adverse effects on accessibility under that definition of consistency? Take checkbox as a great example. Can you identify which of the three checkbox is this for Android, iOS, and web? At first glance, they all look the same. Apart from the first and last checkbox, inputs are bigger than the one in the middle, and each checkbox label is used in a different font. And for those who know what Android and iOS's take faces look like, you probably have the best chance of getting this right. The answers from top to bottom are web, Android, and then iOS. If you look at each one independently though, you would probably have found this task even harder than it already is. This is awesome, right? Checkboxes are going to end up being the same across all our apps and websites. A win for consistent identification, in theory. But then ask yourself the question, how often do you actually run across an iOS checkbox? A quick search on Google renders no stock control results for iOS. The top result in the documentation is, for, is, a, is a documentation from Mac OS's checkbox. That's not right. And then the next two results are questions and articles from Medium and Stack Overflow for creating a checkbox. So where is the stock iOS checkbox? Did I somehow break Google? The result really made me raise an eyebrow. I had to use an emoji here instead to represent this since I can't actually raise one eyebrow at a time. For those who were unable to see my video, I'm desperately trying to raise one but it's not happening. It's both brows or nothing for me, unfortunately. As I stare intently into the search results, my eyebrows grow bigger and bigger. How can there possibly be no iOS checkbox? My eyebrows grew so big, in fact, my wife asked me to politely trim them, but that's a story for another day. Ah, well, maybe the answer is, to the missing checkbox is we are pioneers and so we're the first company to need checkboxes in the iOS app. Mm, nope, that certainly doesn't seem right either. Yeah, let's toss that idea into the trash along with my many miles of CVS receipts. One thing we do in these situations where we're not sure how to correctly solve the problem is to open a bunch of apps developed by the platform creator and take a look at their design patterns to see how they solve similar problems. So what does Apple actually do? Let's take a look first at their mail app. Surprisingly, they do have some form of checkboxes, but it's very different experience compared to what we have on the web. Rather than an inline field set for selecting emails, the selecting is done at the view level. One of the largest differences is there are additional actions available for selected items, such as select all, mark, move, and trash. As I say, a very different experience to what you see on the web. Oh, and the same goes for reminders. A group of chat boxes are also presented at the view level. Once again, I'm provided with additional actions based on the selection. So not only is the identification different, but so is the functionality. Both of those things we have previously ignored and pretended it was just the web, calling the components a chat box when it really is not. On another note, I thought I would share with you a reminder list for this very presentation. According to my list, I've already completed the panting stage of this whole event, but I tell you, that still feels like a work in progress. So what can we learn from this mistake? We have been regularly reminding all of our stakeholders that it is more important to consistently identify components across the user's ecosystem rather than your design system. It has taken us a while to get this message through to them, but this is what worked for us. The vast majority of us don't use an Android and iPhone at the same time. We pick one or the other, but may swap every couple of generations. So consistently identifying with the rest of the ecosystem is far more important as we learning only has to occur in the rare occasions where users switch between operating systems, 
rather than every time they just switch between apps. And of course, there are benefits to assistive technologies too. The semantics between each platform are independent, so conveying a name, role, or value in one platform cannot always be done without implementing bad practice in another. In fact, parity between platforms does not exist whatsoever. Let's take Button, one of the most bare-bone components in every design system. Without this component, no matter what platform you use, it will limit the functionality of your service. And then let's make, an, let's make this example even easier and just talk about the native buttons. In Android's Material Design 3, they defined five buttons, but in iOS, there are only four. So already some disparity. We initially thought we should solve our parity problem by taking a deeper, deeper dive and look purely at each button's purpose rather than just looking at their name to create parity there. The material outline button is equivalent to the iOS tinted button, great start, as well as the material text button with the iOS plain button, lovely. However, by material's definition, the filled, the elevated, and the tonal buttons all provide the same purpose as a filled button on iOS. And finally, the ugly iOS gray button is left all on its own with no parity from Android. When design systems are designed in this way, it creates inconsistent experiences. It's okay for Android and iOS applications to look and function differently, just like it's okay for the user agent to render your website slightly differently between browsers. Platform is based on user preference, and therefore you should respect that. So now we are making our components consistent within a platform. Let's take a look at how we create each component in an accessible way. Let's hand it back over to Megan to tell us more. Thanks, Daniel. So our next question is, are our components accessible? Before we get into that question and the answer to it, let's talk about our team. So at our busiest point, we had four dedicated accessibility folks on the design system team, which consisted of one accessibility designer for each platform, Android, web, and iOS. We also had a representative from our partner program, Accessibility Engineering, to support us in the technical pieces of our process. We collaborate and get input from the Greater Design Accessibility team as well, with the 40 plus members we talked about earlier. And they help us work through our whole workflow and also do some user testing with us. This isn't just a well-resourced team either. We have a reasonably re solid process now with the design system team, and we've continuously improved where we found problems. We're involved from the beginning in the story, component story grooming process to initially define purpose, and this helped us to reduce that dreaded scope creep I talked about earlier. And once the stories are defined, we create an accessibility one pager for each component per platform. The one pager is intended to be referenced throughout the entire process and it has guidance for developers and designers as they create the prototypes. We'll look at this more in a minute. We also provide midpoint and final design feedback as well as documentation reviews based on the outputs and we link back to missing requirements and recommendations from our one pager. Since our one pagers are living documents, we continue to make updates to these as the work progresses. So that by the time the developers are coding the component, our reviews of the implementation are usually going pretty smoothly all the way up to the release of the component. So back to our accessibility one pager. This is one of the most important deliver deliverables that we share throughout our component process. The document begins with a human impact overview that reminds the design system team about the impact this component can have on real people that use our products. We then describe the expected user experience for individuals with considerations for those using assistive technologies to ensure an equitable experience. Throughout the document, we reference WCAG A and AA success criteria to ensure our designs are at least providing the bare minimum. However, a large portion of our one pagers also have recommendations from the intent of WCAG 2.1 criteria at all three levels to further explain the reasoning behind the criterion that we're providing. In addition, we look at future versions of WCAG, like 2.2 and 3.0. We're also looking at research from primary and secondary resources, such as other design systems, live patterns used by companies, and thought leaders in the field. 
This is particularly common when we get to the native components, where WCAG guidelines don't always align with the platform expectations. Lastly, we provide recommendations for the component, components interaction and element states, as we find they're not always designed and considered if we don't provide a friendly reminder. With that, I'll hand it over to Daniel to explain how our stakeholders can think about our one-pagers and our components. The feedback from our design and development partners has been that the one-pagers make it easier to know what is a requirement versus a recommendation, but also learn the intent and benefits behind many of our points, which often leads to adopting many of our recommendations. The one-pager it forms the foundation to be able to build accessibility into our design and coded components. This is done by reducing documentation, reduces implementation risks, improves consistent identification, reduces the burden for design teams during handoff by having fewer annotations and many of the states, the focus indicator, the target size and other properties already handled. Having the central design team enables us to collaborate and very often persuade stakeholders to adopt recommendations just once. These discussions are repetitive and often lost when not solved at the design system level. Adopting recommendations on a per team basis can lead to issues with consistent identification as those same discussions have varying outcomes across different teams. One example of how we've built recommendations into the design system is by conforming to AAA criterion target size making what is technically a recommendation a requirement for all of our services using the design system. We've even gone as far as to create a focus indicator that will meet the future WACAD 2.2 focus visible minimum success criterion. Another recommendation turned design system requirements and therefore a win for all the people that will benefit. Oh, and one more thing. Not only does the design system get lots of input from the dedicated team of accessibility folks, but we always peer review documentation and unusual designs with other accessibility designers outside of the design system team to get a fresh perspective. Why? Well, the working draft of the challenges with accessibility guidelines, conformance and testing cites research that pulling the results of two independent experienced evaluators would be the best option capturing at most 76% of the true problems and producing only 24% of false positives, increasing the accessibility and making sure there are less things slip through. So now we have told you our process, let's go back to that original question we had for this section. Are the components accessible? Let's imagine the launch of design system version one 12 or 13 months ago. Finally, all of our hard work was going to be available to the entire organization. Our processes had been a success. We were confident and had validated the accessibility of our components. But we quite quickly received several bits of feedback from fellow UX designers that they can't use this because it's not accessible. Um, what? At this point, my heart sank and my eyebrows started to rise again. Emails coming through from management questioning what happened and so my eyebrows grow bigger and bigger. I think you know what's coming next. So big to the point where my wife had gotten so fed up with telling me to trim my eyebrows, she just shaved them right off. Wait, let's pause here. You may be wondering, how did we mess up? How did we release inaccessible components whilst having our well-resourced team, our refined design system process, our in-depth, well-researched one pages, and our peer reviews with other alley designers? Well, the answer is we didn't. The components were accessible. However, some stakeholders were falsely claiming they weren't. The view to the problem was a lack of accessibility knowledge and a lack of trust as they did not know anything about the team and all the processes that went into the behind the scenes to making components accessible. In all fairness though, we did not tell anyone that our components were accessible. Let me just read you a small quote from a design system landing page. Just under the heading section, we have three statements about our design system. The first is, our design system is accessible and is created to help products remove informational, technical and cognitive barriers. Oh dear, my eyebrows started, to, my eyebrows grew back again, even bigger than before. Hmm, what went wrong? Clearly something was not right. 
I've illustrated this by acute gray footage trying to understand why her mouse isn't working on her soft toy laptop. We narrowed down the misunderstandings to several things which we are now working to improve. We never told the enterprise we had several dedicated accessibility designers supporting the design system team. In fact, all of you here today are some of the first to actually know this. We had no clear processes to build trust within the design or development teams. We weren't having regular dialogue within teams. Uh, sorry, we weren't having regular dialogue within the teams within the organization either. And also, accessibility isn't binary, it's a scale. Without dialogue within teams, it's difficult to take accessible components and expect them to still remain accessible after being implemented in context. We continue to work across the organization to help teams understand the benefits of the design system, how to use it, and the backlog issues that bubble up. Let's hand it back over to Megan to finish up and give you the takeaways. Thanks, Daniel. As we finish up the presentation portion of our time today, we wanted to leave you with a few things. To recap what we, talk about, what we talked about during our session, here are a few takeaways. First, keep scope in check by grouping components, considering the user need, setting parameters, backlogging the unknown, and setting a clear definition before moving forward. Second, platform parity doesn't exist. Design components that are expected within each platform. Third, integrate the clear processes for accessibility and don't be afraid to share them proudly across the organization. And fourth, Accessibility One Pagers helped us to set clear requirements and expectations. They also helped us inform the why behind our reasoning. We're trying to make things for real people. We also wanted to share a list of our favorite resources with you so you can access them later. These resources are sites that we value and validate. However, we do not directly use the materials and we end up customizing them for our own use cases. So some of the things we reference are Aviva Standards Design System, Gov.UK Design System, Hayden Pickering's website about building inclusive components, Content Design London Guidelines for writing about people. These really help us when we're writing our human impact statements and provide the reminders of why we're doing this work. We also reference developer documentation from Android for building for accessibility into the apps and Orange Ally Guidelines for iOS development. We hope you can find some of these useful in your own work. And with that, uh, Daniel and I wanna thank you again for your time today, and we'd love to answer any questions that you have for the remainder of the time. Great, thank you, Megan. Thank you, Daniel. Excellent presentation. Let's get into some of your questions. First question we have here is, is the one pager shared with consumers of your design system as part of documentation or is it only for the teams creating the system? So the intent of the one pager is really to provide guidance for the design system team. Um, some of this does get adopted into the documentation that is provided with the greater organization though. Um, so it, it does get incorporated in a, in a non uh, exact way, <laughs> if that makes sense. Excellent, thank you. Next question here. How do you distinguish between errors and brand slash primary colors? And did the brand color initially pass AA co color contrast? And if not, how did you approach that? I'll let you take this one, Megan. You've, you've been working with us one on the errors, so I'll let you take this. Um, so yes, we're, we're still working through colors um, with our brand team, and um, that is something that often comes up with companies with red um, in, their, in their brand colors. It's, it's challenging to make those work. Um, so we are continuing to work on finding other ways to identify errors versus the brand colors, and um, maybe even consider reducing the amount of brand colors within some of the screens like forms. Awesome. Next up is a question from Kent. They ask, please talk about how you, how you test all of your components with users. Daniel, do you want to speak to some yeah, of these? I'll, I'll take this one. Um, so um, Kent, we, are, we work very closely with our accessibility engineering uh, and, and many of those, they, they build their, their use cases 
um, of, of real people and to help be as accurate as possible. Um, we, we definitely could do a better job of testing with real users. Uh, and that's something that we definitely want to improve uh, in the future. Um, and so we, we, will, we want to do that and to have, to have more research-based um, evidence in, in our one pages from our own users on CBS, uh, because they're, they're, all, all users are slightly different and then on what service you use. Thank you, Daniel. All right, next question here uh, asks, why do you have specifically accessibility designers on your team? Shouldn't everyone apply accessibility to their work at a foundational level? Yeah, that, that is a great point. Uh, and kind of one of the one of the uh, the jokes we say to each other is the day we the day we lose our jobs, it's a good thing because we've we've got to a stage where we've taught people the foundations of accessibility, they're applying it without us having to remind them and point out things. Uh, and so when that happens, we'll be happy uh, and sad. But um, we, we, we want it to be day because at the end of the day, it's best for our users. And so we, we, we are working to constantly remind people of these things and teach people and coach them. Uh, these are the things you should look out for. Well put. Another question here about the one pager. Uh, this person asks, how many details are included in the one pager? And could you perhaps give some examples? Sure. Um, so some of the details depends on uh, the component that we're working on, of course, but um, we pr try to provide as, as much detail as we can for the expected experience and supporting documentation for what that can look like. Um, so whether that's something that we've mocked up ourselves with the work of accessibility engineering, or um, if that's something that we've been able to identify examples in the wild, um, we try to provide as much guidance as we can with the development team on the design system. Um, we also work really closely during that user testing process with the accessibility engineering and, and our team as well uh, to check and see that things are matching up with what we expected. Um, so when things are released to the organization, um, they're, they're pretty clearly aligned with what we intended at, from the beginning. Hopefully that answers your question. <laughs> Excellent, thank you. Can you elaborate on your restricted names list with examples of what names did not get on the list and what names were accepted? Yeah, so the, uh, the, the name, we don't add the names to the list, um, particularly the names are really defined by the component specification um, and sorry, by the, by the platform specification. So you know, the, the easiest example is, is um, the ARIA, ARIA roles list. And so like, for example, role status and role alerts they create live regions um, for um, live regions for, for AT to interact with, um, and so we we found often that we 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 have we have so called status messages, which may not necessarily happen as a, as a dynamic uh, message. They be there they'll be there on page load, and so we're we're not in charge of, of what is on and on that what isn't on that list. We just want to try and reduce the chances of being things being misused. Um, because developers will often see, oh, it's a status message, I will use role status, when that may not be the case because the use case is completely wrong. Um, so this is to reduce that risk. Great. Can you talk more about the human impact overview? What topics does it touch on and is it similar to a use case? Um, it is similar to the use cases and there is some overlap. The human impact statement is really highlighting um, as many different user groups as we can in the initial definition of, of the component and, and exploring, you know, what are some of the challenges that could come up if we didn't consider some of the accessibility guidance from WCAG and beyond um, when we're creating this component. So trying to avoid issues for users um, with different assistive technology needs or or different um you know different ways of thinking so we're trying to think about the entire um sphere of humans as we're as we're developing these and, and making sure that we uh cause as, as few problems as possible for users um on the other end fantastic thanks for that detail there and thank you everybody for your great questions um we'll keep rolling with the amount of time we have left so next up is a question about 
uh, ratio of UX designers to accessibility designers to engineers. Can you speak a little bit about the, uh, the makeup of those teams? You're taking it back down on me. I, I, I can take. I can take it from. So, from a design system point of view, um, there there is. Uh, it, it differs depending on on what teams um, have have what resources and and, and the, the needs there. Um, but from a design system point of view, we are we we usually um, we're kind of at a stage where we're one accessibility designer to two UX slash product designers, um, and then that's also there are usually two engineers too. So we're kind of a yeah, one to two to two, I guess, would be the ratio. I've got that right, um, and that's that. And that's because in, in our design system team, we're we're working very closely with each other. Uh, I mean, we want to we want to reduce the amount of uh, miscommunication. So having having a closely um, high high working team is has been working well for us, and, and I think we'll continue to work that way. And then um, the greater for the greater organization, um, there's there's over a hundred design teams within CVS Health uh, working on different things uh, across the organization, um, and our forty plus design accessibility folks support those teams. And so um, there may be one design accessibility person supporting um, three or four teams within a larger agile train. Um, so that's sort of what that makeup looks like, um, but supporting things that are all within the same product category and um, kind of are all related. So try to manage it that way. Wonderful. And in a similar vein, what is your relationship with teams that are not consuming your design system? Is accessibility a driver for design system adoption? Yeah, that, that's one of the what's one of the bigger um, kind of wins that we try and push on people and not just access, not just accessibility ourselves our, our leaders are very aware that accessibility is one of the benefits um, so that design system adoption of design system is one of the benefits are is improving accessibility uh, because you know it, it once if once accessibility defects go through that requires rework either probably most likely at the design stage before then going back through code um, and so our, we we all as a, as a as an organization do do a good job of trying to adopt the design system because of accessibility uh, and uh, consistency is one of those things that kind of goes hand in hand. Um, we, for teams that haven't adopted the design system, um, there definitely are that them, um, but it they they usually don't they usually don't not adopt the design system because of accessibility issues. There's usually technical barriers uh, with with what the the, um, the frameworks and things that teams are using, and so we're trying to we're trying to to fix that so that isn't a problem. Uh, and so you know where where teams aren't using the design system, we do have accessibility designers and engineers working in those teams to still make sure what they release are accessible. Um, and so at the end of the day, you know our, our users aren't going to be affected by any internal problems we have. Excellent. All right, thank you everybody who's using the little upvote feature that makes my job easier. Um, do you include accessibility annotations in your design systems? Go ahead. Sure. So um, the accessibility annotations happen more within the design teams and the design accessibility folks that are supporting those. Um, those design annotations definitely happen um, at handoff for the development teams when they pick them up. Um, we have a little bit less of a formal process within the design system space since, as Daniel mentioned, we're working so closely with those UX designers and the developers. So it's more of a one-on-one -on -one conversation and, and really having that dialogue back and forth. Um, so not, not as formal as it would be on a, on a team. Yeah. And also many of our components are, are such an atomic level. And we, we've really been pushing to use native or user agent as much as you can. And so, you know, when we're, when we're designing and releasing a button, we don't necessarily have to annotate much because we're just using the, the, you know, the, the default HTML button. There isn't much annotate on that. And so sticking as close to the platform as we possibly can is help reducing those need for annotations and having anything custom um, to, make, to make that easier. Thanks, Daniel. Awesome. Rolling right along here. Are your systems web components also in scope for any sort of recurring accessibility audit? So everything that is released in the design system 
does go through the formal um, accessibility reviews that the engineering team does. So the accessibility engineers are really the ones that are looking at conformance and, and checking based on their test plans. And so if any issues came up with the design system components, they would flag it for us and, and bring it back to us. And then at that point, we would um, take a closer look and, and remediate any issues that came through. Um, so it just gets put through the more formal process of what they're looking for within the features and, and the products within the organization just about so by the end of it it's gone through two accessibility engineer checks the one at the design system level and then one at the team level who are using our components mm -hmm. awesome a question about screen reader announcements so this person asks how do you document the screen reader announcements for a pattern are they like guidelines Do you want me to take that one, Daniel? Or? Yeah. Sorry. So um, we understand that uh, various setups within uh, your, your browser combination, your assistive technology on whichever device you're using um, can vary. And so we document the expected experience um, at, a, at a high level, but realize that some of that can change depending on what the user's combinations are. Um, so from an atomic level, when we're looking at the components, we, we document that um, to, to at least remind folks that this is what uh, the experience we're expecting for a couple of the main combinations that we look at, but realize that it may alter. Um, and then especially when it gets put into a larger pattern or, or a feature, um, that can change. And so that's really where our accessibility engineers come into play and, and check those more thoroughly. Fantastic. Another question about the design system. How do you make sure users of your design system make use of the accessibility features you provide? For example, if someone says the design system is not accessible? Yeah, so um, when, when we build our components, like for example, let's, let's talk about target size um, for on web, for example, we, we make sure that our inputs or buttons will have an, a minimum um, width or height defined in them um, to make it hard for, for developers, or make, it, make it more difficult for developers and trains using them to, to overwrite. Um, but we, it's more of a governance issue and we make it very clear in the documentation, you, know, you shouldn't be changing these values, you shouldn't be changing the color because of X, Y, Z reasons, you know, you, you're gonna cause accessibility issues. Um, and so, it, you know, it, it, at the end of the day, it comes down to trust that people are using our design system right. But also, we know we have those checks from accessibility engineering and our assess accessibility designers and the trains who will say, you know, you aren't using this right. And you know, if, if you're if you're changing the size of something, we can we can essentially bring that down back to a consistent identification issue. And so, there really isn't no issue when there's no issues really when people try and um, differentiate it because we always have a reason to say, you know, you're, you're doing this wrong. You know. Absolutely. Question from Sophia. How did you resolve the communication issues between the accessibility teams and the rest of the organization? Uh, what about permanent resolutions as a result? So were there any resolutions that remained permanent as a result of those communication issues? I think um, it's a it's a developing story for sure. We have a huge organization and a lot of folks that are coming and um, you know we're growing and so there's a lot of new folks that come in. And I think one of the things that we've tried to do is, is create this sort of idea of office hours and have more regular dialogue and, and invite as many folks as we can to have that dialogue with the team. So um, whether that's asking questions or um, sort of giving a short demo of some things that we We've released. Um, also, the design accessibility team does uh, sessions called deep dives where we um, cover different topics um, once a month and, and we really dive deep into some of the accessibility considerations. And some of that does go back to the design system as well. So um, trying to trying to do a number of avenues to get folks interested in and involved in the process um, has helped us, but definitely have work to do still. <laughs> Everything's a work in progress. Indeed. <laughs> My question from Paco. When you say there is no platform parity, are you including visuals? Can a button, uh, 
Can a button look the same across platforms but have different accessibility solutions? Could you repeat that one more time? It was quite a long question. I think not most of it, but I'll double check. Sure. So when you say there's no platform parity, are you including visuals? Can a button look the same across platforms but have a different accessibility solution? Yeah, so, so things can definitely look the same um, as, long as, as long as they're expected to look that way on that platform too. So that is the most important thing. You know, let, let's say we wanted to have you know, our, them, you know, a, a certain button read as long as, as long as, you know, I, I like it, let's say, you know, what, we, what we're trying to be called on some types of systems is the primary button. That could be read on both iOS and Android, for example, as long as both in Android and iOS, they both allow that to be read for, for that use case. And so there's nothing, there's, you know, when there are parities within the way it looks, that is an awesome thing because it does help make it even more consistent, but it's not as important as making it consistent in the platform. Super. Can you speak more to how the accessibility designers and UX or product designers work together and how the roles are different? Sure. So the, um, the accessibility designer um, acts as a um, resource and um, almost like a consultant within the team. And so they're there to um, be there from the beginning of the wireframing process and um, answer questions, uh, point out things that could create issues later on. Um, so they work in tandem. They're actually, they're part of the team. So they work hand in hand with the UX designers and, and the product folks um, when they come in. And so um, they really are, each, each of us is, are sort of integrated um, within, within each team that we work with. So um, that's helped quite a bit. It builds trust in, in those relationships. Absolutely. All right, I think we have time for at least one more question here. Um, what was the process like for switching to APCA from WCAG 2.1 AAA? So repeat that one more time, please, sorry. Sure, what was the process like for switching to APCA from WCAG 2.1 AA or AAA? So we are, we are still um, going via the, the requirements in WCAG 2.1 because they are, they are still the, the set standards that the organization must adhere to. Um, but we, where, where there are, um, where we can, we use APCA to help, with, especially with our, whether when we have a conversations about minimum font size, we often have conversations um, related, related to that and how, you know, what's, the minim, what's the minimum it can be. You know, we like, you know, we, we, we try and push for 16 pixels, but some people, you know, I'm not mentioning any particular stakeholders want it to be 12 pixels because they you know they want to kind of hide it a little bit. We have we have those discussions and you know and the, a, the APCA has been really helpful in saying, you know, if you want it to be this color, you know, for level four, it needs to be 14 pixels at, at minimum. You know, even though WACTA 2.1 doesn't say that at all, we use that to help as a recommendation that you should adopt these certain things. Great, thank you, Daniel. Okay, I think we are about at time. Thank you everyone for your great questions and participation today. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, Daniel, for your amazing presentation. Um, I hope everybody enjoys the rest of their AxCon and have a great rest of your day. Thank you very much. Thanks everybody. Thank you.